But before I do that, I will show you that um, I got this empty folder here. And um, I like to use git bash to get um, what I need. And I'm going to change directory to this, to this matter folder that I'm currently in. That's the traditional, the tradition of doing something. Now I'm here and I'm simply, you, you got the link already, you're probably, or you should have all the code available. I'm just showing you how easy it is to use Git Bash in case you um, downloaded it manually. So you can see now that uh, just using the clone command uh, in Git has made sure that I got all the code I need in this folder. And I'm going to open this uh, matchup file and you can do the same. And the first thing that we will have to do is fix the directories. So I'm going to work in this directory and this is my root. Um, you can see, but you would need to adapt that to any kind, any empty folder that you would like. The additional directories that we need are the paths to, um, for example, your your code for this um, end toolbox that is required for this tutorial. And I got that in this folder. And we also need SPM 12, so I got that in that folder. And you also need field trip but field trip is not required in the first part of this um, tutorial. And I'm going to just run this using F9 or the evaluate selection points. So when I look into my path, it will have these different, um, this, these different um, repositories. And of course, I also need to add the um, code that uh, um, includes field trip in SPM, and that makes uh, that is possible via this command here. It's the same as using SPM EG, um, but SPM EG opens these windows that you wouldn't need. So I thought that it makes sense to really give all the control in your hand and when you want to play around, and that's why I decided to have you in your code create the signals that we're going to work with yourself. So this is SPM, we can quit this. And this is what happens in this um, section. You don't have to worry about this, you just need to run it. And when you run this, you will uh, see the spec simulation is running and the two new files will have appeared. And if we look into this uh, file outside of MATLAB, you can basically see that there are, see that there are some like numbers in this um, CSV file, and there's some text file that uh, um, includes some information. And I, I created this because this is my experience how I would get electrophysiology data from collaborators. You would probably have some kind of original data set file in a very like unclear format in the beginning, and you would have some additional info on the recording. And it can, uh, I, I think this is my main point of the whole tutorial, that electrophysiology signals are just time series of voltages, and they can re be represented in text even. So it's, you don't need crazy specific file formats for that. There are many different file formats, but ultimately the, what is stored is a simple series of numbers inside uh, uh, any kind of data file. So we're going to um, not go into the specifics of this simulation, but it's really nice if you uh, want to have a look and need some um, examples where you simulate some electrophysiology data, the field trip FRAX simulation is uh, 
the way to look where you can find something that could help you. So the first step that we're going to do is we're going to clear all everything, have a clean slate, close all figures, and uh, we are just in our new folder. We have these data sets, uh, this data set here, and we have this info file. Now, the most important thing is that we get this time series into our uh, MATLAB workspace. And I like the read table command from MATLAB uh, if you deal with any kind of table. And uh, to get it into an array, you just need to convert table to array. This is an example of how you would convert a CSV file. But uh, in a more general sense, you need to find a way to, uh, to load the data as an array or any kind of MATLAB um, variable. And for this particular example, this command does the job. We now have an array that is 16,800 points times 16 um, columns. So uh, this translates into 16 channels and um, 16,800 samples. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, this is 16 channels that we have um, recorded here. And now we, it's the first time after the recording that we are opening them. And of course, we can visualize that. And you can see, OK, it seems like there is some activity in there. There's no zero lines, but difficult to make sense out of this at this point. So the very crucial information that you need is the sampling rate. The sampling rate tells you how much time is covered by the, the uh, interval between samples. And depending, if, if you don't know the sampling rate, you cannot really make sense out of the data because they, it could be anything. And this is visualized and conceptualized in this plot that you can run. So you can see here now um, you have 16 channels. And if you add, if you assume that this was recorded with a sampling rate of 2,000 hertz, so 2,000 samples per second, this recording would have a length of eight seconds. But if you would assume that you had a sampling rate of 50 hertz, the same recording would, would, would uh, have a length of 335 seconds. So the, this is not something that is stored inside the data itself. And it is impossible to know this just from looking at the raw data. That is an additional information that you need. And um, of course, we know this because we created the signal, and I have stored this inside the um, info text file. And for that, it's useful to know that there are many different abbreviations of the sampling rate, which is really stupid because it is so important. It would be nice to have a very standardized uh, name for it, but we usually don't. There are a few few different potential names that you can find it under. And in this case, I call it an FS, the sort of frequency of sampling. And that would be 280 here. Um, there's some more information in this text file. And at some point, it's just saying that the sampling interval was 3.57. And you could also use that information to derive the sampling rate, because you would know like how many times 3.57 milliseconds fit into a second to get to roughly 280 hertz. So now that we have this, um, the sampling rate, that is in this case called F sample, uh, FS, often also called F sample, sometimes called sampling rate or SR. So have, keep your eyes open for anything that could fit this, uh, this format. In, your, uh, in the info that you get. And if you don't find it, ask your collaborators. Don't just assume something. Um, you, it is impossible to know if you don't uh, find it in, in the info that you get. Or ask your, like, the person who recorded the data. So now we have defined the sampling rate as 280 um, samples per second. And uh, you can see that the original recording time was apparently 60 seconds, so one minute. 
And that is, of course, dramatically different to what we've seen before with eight seconds or 300 seconds. But um, you can do a feasibility, you cannot assume it, but you can do a feasibility check. And the most prominent activity that you would see in LFP, but also in EG, is either beta or alpha oscillations. And we have simulated some of those oscillations in this data set. And then you can go about and count the number of phases that are um, inside here. So I'm going to zoom out a bit. So we have a period of one second from 21 to 22 here, and we can use for example, this signal here and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, um, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. So it's not. It is a little bit ambiguous at times, but roughly the uh, we got like twenty three between twenty and twenty five cycles of this activity inside the one second, which translates into a twenty two or twenty three hertz rhythm. So that makes sense. It could be, but of course, it could also be an alpha rhythm that we see, and it should be uh, rather ten, and then the sampling rate would be. Um, uh, uh, but double or half the amount. So you cannot just judge by the uh, oscillations and what you expect, but at least you can do a rough feasibility check of uh, whether um, the signal content that you have kind of ex uh, follows the expected behavior. And in this case, it does. So <clears throat> if, if, if we look at our text file info again, uh, of course, this is a very convenient text file info to make make it possible to cover all this in a very uh, relatively short amount of time. Um, you can see that there are here there are some channel entries and some additional info, because the next information that we need will be the channel names. And if you dig into this text file, it actually tells you the channel names, and then you can plot it together. Oh, I did not run this. And this basically gives you what you need to do your analysis. It tells you the different channels, even though the names are not standardized yet, and uh, it, the, all the signal is there, you have the correct sampling rate. So if you have the original signal, the sampling rate, and this channel description, that's where you can actually start analyzing and potentially writing papers. Um, you can see here some additional um, uh, uh, info that there's just noise in this ch channel 3. And that is how it would look for us, because we did not connect SCNL 3, but we like to keep it there to be able to remind ourselves that this was the reference. So the reference is empty because we did not, uh, the, the channel three of the left hemisphere is empty because we connected it to the reference. So this is how you would deal with raw data inside MATLAB. And you can start creating your own script to an analyze that. If you're comfortable with FFT or other functions, you can manipulate the data directly in MATLAB and you don't need any further signal processing toolboxes. But I would still advise you to adhere to certain standards from renowned electrophysiology processing toolboxes, because it's um, more reproducible what you do, and it is easier to follow, and is validated by thousands of people who have used it before. It's so easy to create like a small bug that you look over in your own data, um, and that is much harder to happen if you follow the organization and the code of a defined electrophysiology toolbox. And I don't care which one. Um, I think for import and output and um, compatibility, field trip is great. 
and uh, that's why I've used it. So the for next step that we're going to do is to um, translate the original raw data into field trip. And we're starting from scratch, we're cleaning, clearing anything. And we have the raw data loaded again the same way before as before. And now we just follow the data uh, convention of field trip and get the data into, into there. So every field trip data set has a trial, a data dot trial structure. So we're going to create that. And that's where the raw data are stored. You can see that we, I have transposed the raw data because field trip and I2 and all, maybe basically all the other toolboxes that I know expect the data in the format of, um, of channels by samples. And you can see that our raw data originally was in samples by channels. So we simply turn it around and you can see now that uh, in our trial structure, it is channels by samples. Then you, you create a time vector that you need for field trip. And that is a linear interpolation of the length or the number of samples that we have in our raw data and the sampling rate. And so you can create your own time vector using this in space command. Um, if you don't get it right away, don't worry about it. You can play, about, play, play around with this command and um, you will understand it very quickly. Now we have loaded the channel names as before, and this they go into the data.label structure for field trip convention. And you need the in addition to the time, you need the sampling rate. And the reason why field trip requires both time and sampling rate, even though you can create time from sampling rate, is that at sometimes it may make sense to have absolute time points. So instead of saying the starting point is time point zero, you may want to say the starting point is 100 seconds after some event or something like that. So you can have additional information in the time vector that could not be restored using just the sampling rate. And I like to, uh, to add all the additional info to the data set structure too that I have. So basically, I just store the additional text info that we loaded um, as an additional structure, but that is not, um, not any field trip convention. You can add whatever you want. And if you save this now manually as a matter file, this data structure, you have a field trip electrophysiology file. And you can perform any kind of um, field trip uh, visualization, and you can use start using field trip functions, just for example, filtering the data for inside the uh, data browser from field trip. You can start selecting uh, bad, bad segments and things like that. And I think this is the main message that I want to give you uh, in your hands: that if you have any kind of data set, it's just time series, and it's basically takes two seconds to get this into a field trip format when you know the right code. And I have created a wrapper function in my toolbox for that. So it's basically just one line. You need as an input the raw data, the channel names, and the sampling rate, which are the crucial info. And um, you can add some information and decide whether it should go into a field trip or, a, or a SPM data set. And you run this, and the output is a perfectly um, prepared field trip data set that you can share and use even in Python, as Timon will show you. Okay, so, but, but that's, and this is the most important milestone of this um, um, tutorial. Looking at the time a bit, I will, um, I, I will run this and tell you that in addition to just, not just loading it, you may also use uh, this initial step to um, make sure that everything is standardized, for example, creating a standardized rule set for your channel names for LFP and ECOG channels and EMG can make sense. And you can create some code or use code that is available, like my channel converter here, that can help you with steps like this. 
to get an additional set of depths and information into your uh, recordings. One additional info that is in the text file, for example, is the time point of the recording and the reference. And um, we talked about this. It is important to know the reference. So that is uh, similar to the sampling rate. We don't know what the reference was, and we don't really know how to deal with the data. But of course, some analysis can be done even if we don't know the reference. But I would not advise to be blind about that. And you can see in the text file, it was written down reference was SCNL3. And given that this is also an empty channel in there, that's a very likely candidate. So um, after running all this again, we have this more organized data set with standardized data channel labels and um, additional information that is stored in this field trip file. You can have a look at that offline later and ask questions if you don't get it or if you have trouble. But basically, we now really have a data set for further analysis. And I like to use SPM mainly because I was in London working with Vladimir Litvak and he has written this toolbox and he has uh, supervised me uh, very, uh, very nicely. And uh, that's how I kind of get, got comfortable with this. And um, uh, that's why I, I still adhere to many uh, SPM functions, but all everything we do can be done in different toolboxes. So this is just showing you again that we have this empty channel here, and you can see that compared to this signal, uh, where you can actually see oscillatory activity, um, this signal only has a relatively flat uh, amplitude curve. So here there's ups and downs, whereas here there's just noise. And you should be able to detect that, that this is noise and the rest looks physiological. Okay, now it comes to the hard part. Because before we want to go on with these analysis, we want to re-reference. And to get to the adjacent contact bipolar re-referencing um, scheme montage, and for that, we should remind ourselves that referencing is nothing else but subtraction. So you want the difference of the, of the two voltages. And if they have the same reference, you can simply subtract two channels from another or two raw signals from another to get the bipolar signal. And I have prepared a one-liner for that. So we have four channels for the right hemisphere, and we want to create three bipolar channels, so one, two, two, three, three, four. And uh, when we, you evaluate this line, that's what's happening. So basically, you index the first three and subtract the uh, three to channels three to four from them, and then you get three new signals with the bipolar re-reference scheme, scheme. And um, to add that to our data set, I would always call them zero, one, one, two, two, three. That's it for the right hemisphere. It's super simple. Um, you can follow it in the code. We know that the reference, oh, I didn't add that. Doesn't matter. So you know that um, the reference was channel L3. For the left hemisphere, therefore, you need to be a little bit more um, cautious. For the right hemisphere, it was straightforward, adjacent contacts. Um, you can subtract all of those. But given that contact three on the left side is empty, uh, yeah, contact three on the left side is empty, so the fourth channel is empty. Um, you need to be more careful for the left hemisphere. And what we would do is simply to subtract, if we uh, look at the left channels again, so in other words, we have contact, uh, contact one, zero on the left side, contact one on the left side, contact two on the left side, and contact three on the left side. We know this one is empty. So what we, st we start off by just subtracting these two from another. So th these uh, contact pairs are straightforward. We subtract the voltage that is in here from the one that is in here, and the one here that is uh, the one from here 
to the one that is in here. And then we get two bipolar channels. Now, what about the third contact? And that is something that is um, easier to remind ourselves about if we look at this table. We, what we have created is the bipolar reference of these two, right? And what about the third one? Now, since the left contact three is the reference already in hardware, if we look at this name, that's the main reason why I wrote down this name, is you can see that it's already the bipolar derivation. It is the difference between contract L left two and contact STN left three. So that's fine, it's done. This contact already is a bipolar montage and all we need to do is add this contact exactly as it was, which is kind of redundant, but easier to follow later on. So if we just add the third contact as it was without any subtraction, that is the bipolar derivation of this channel of interest that we look at, which would we would call a contact left three, two, three. So this is the channel namings. For ECOG, we can do the same. We can um, create bipolar references, but um, often for ECOG recordings, similar to EG, what I've mentioned before, you would do a common average re-referencing. That means that you literally calculate the average of, the, uh, of all ECOG channels. So we get the indices of the channels, and we calculate the average of all the channels and we subtract this average from each individual channel. So we have four, four voltage um, time series here, and we subtract at every sample, every time point, the average across all these voltages. And that takes out all the signal that is common and exactly the same in between these channels. And I like to simply add the uh, CRARs as common average referencing to the channel names, and you can do this using the code that I provided. So this is ECOG1, ECOG2, ECOG3, and ECOG4, always with the common average referencing denominator. And this should get you a more clean um, ECOG signal without contamination of the reference. But as I said before, we can also create these um, bipolar um, derivations, again, by subtracting the first three channels um, from the second to the fourth channel and adding these channel names. So this, in this case, it would be ECOG L12, L23, and L34. And this is how we would add the names. Same thing for EEG. Often we would like to have a very clean EEG that is free from contamination in the, our case of the um, EEG uh, of the SDN signal. Even though you may not see the SDN signal because it can be low in amplitude compared to EEG, you might want to get rid of it and make sure that you only have EEG left in your signal and you can do that by calculating a bipolar derivation of C3, C set, which would give you a nice local motor cortex and SMA um, or motor signal from the EEG without contamination of STN channels. And uh, finally, the same is true for EMG, where you always want to have a bipolar derivation. Now, I, I added some code how you can add all these um, new channels into your um, into your data set. And you can see now, if we look at the channel labels in our data set, we have the original 16 channels, which are here until, until here. And then we also have the new bipolar derivations. We have the common average ECOG, we have the um, bipolar ECOG, and we have the bipolar EG and EMG channels. And certain, suddenly from 16 channels, we have gone to 31 channels. And um, finally, we may remove the empty uh, reference channel because it is um, just noise and nothing in there. And basically describing it as LFP3 left is wrong because that was never connected. So you might want to get rid of that 
And from there, you can start your pre-processing. Your data set is really perfectly fit for any kind of analysis that you want to do. Before re-referencing, you should not try to get great results from anything because you are not certain what the exact source of the signal that you're looking at would be. But um, I, I always like to like do some pre-processing here, for example, filtering and um, converting it to the format that I like and basically have a clean slate with a new file name. In this case, I call it reref as the SPM file or reref field trip for the field trip file and that has been created now here using some of the info before. Okay, so from there, this is really where I think I am comfortable doing any kind of analysis. And um, here's some example of stuff like calculating power spectrum or um, time frequency transform um, that helps us make sense out of the time series in terms of like oscillatory activity. And uh, we're not going to we'll go into more detail here about these analysis because Esther is going to talk more about the theory of these um, analysis. I basically wanted to show you that here you have a clean data set, you know exactly what the reference was, you have a bipolar derivation of your LFP, and you can start analyzing oscillatory activity patterns, connectivity, or whatever. And it makes sense that you have stored this data set separately as your kind of source or raw data, because you would always need to do the referencing. And uh, it's nice to have a data set where you got all that done already. Okay, so this is the final part, and this is basically a little bit more complicated, and um, since the time has passed a lot, I'm not going to go into the, the whole details of, of the framework, but I just want to show you briefly that it's easy to convert such a data set into the standard bits format. So that is the brain uh, imaging data structure. And the brain imaging data structure has oh, some, uh, there are some slides on, on additional information that you can follow if you didn't um, get what I was saying. But uh, we, we are at this point now, and uh, there's this nice publication on IEG bits where it basically tells us how to standardize how we store the data. And that refers mainly to meta information and the way the photos and um, data sets are structured. And we are currently working on a folder and a suggestion for a data set structure for LFP and DBS research. So keep your eyes open for that. It's not finished just yet, um, but that's a discussion that we want to have in the WeTune CRC and make sure that we are all on the same boat in how we store the data because that would make it much easier to uh, get, collaborate. So you can add some information. That those are info that I got from the text file and um, some additional um, you know, specifics, for example, power line frequency in Europe is always 50 hertz, in the US it's always 60 hertz. And it's super easy to go from the field trip. We, we're simply loading up the field trip file and we are using the field trip command data to bits. To be able to do that though, we need to make sure that we have this um, field trip toolbox in place. And actually, I don't even know if I still have it in place. Oh, that's a little bit uh, shameful. Huh? Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's here. Okay, so this is where my field trip code is. I'm sim simply going to put it here. And I'm, you can see I, I don't have anything in our workspace anymore. I'm just loading the field trip file. And you remember that you can create this field trip data set by hand, really. It's um, pretty simple and straightforward, and you just need to add some information. It's quite well documented, a little bit buggy in some cases, but um, if you run this, you um, will get the beautiful 
bits data set that gives you a, a participants um, table where uh, the information that you gave in, for example, this is subject zero, you have like a GPDS score in there, you have the information which electrode was in, was recorded, which ECOG strip, things like that. That's all, everything you can put inside this code. And you, if you look at the structure itself, you can see that uh, quite a few new files have been generated that contain information on the channels, so what they what their names are. You can uh, have look have a look at the header file. This is um, converted now into the Brain Vision EEG file format, which is um, suggested as the best format for the um, bit standard, and that is one of the reasons that you can have a look at the header file, which is machine and human readable, and it gives you already important information on the channels, on the sampling interval, and all the stuff that I told you is really crucial is stored already in these human readable additional header files. And the real EG data are stored in this EG file. 